Welcome to Mindless Entertainment. It is I, Jesse Milestone, coming to you on this Friday with both good news and bad news. I have a really bad feeling about this. Where people were just walking around, just jizzing force all over the place. He looks like he has been drinking soy from his mother's tea. Wrap yourselves in, guys, because we are going to get mean. I got him. Great kid. Don't get cocky. Welcome to Miles Entertainment. My name is Jesse Milestone. I'm here on a very, very special Saturday. Uh, your God Empress has brought you the most fun I could possibly bring you on a Saturday or just the coolest stream that we could have done. So first, guys, uh, with me, of course, is my my other half, my better half, the amazing uh, front man for world-class bullshitters, the one and only Jeff Hicks. Woo! Yay! I wanted my own intro so he could get water. What's up? Ah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, guys, you know him, you love him, also from World Class Bullshitters, the one and only Dion Green. Uh, baby, baby, what's up, everybody? And last but certainly not least, uh, uh, this guy, I don't know how better to introduce, introduce him. He won an Academy Award for working on a very special movie. It's called Star Wars. It came out in 1977. You might have heard of it. Um, he's been working in the film industry uh, longer than most of us have been on this planet. And he's going to bring some of that knowledge and expertise to us today. Guys, uh, make give a very, very warm welcome to Richard Chu. So Richard, welcome, welcome back again. Thank you for rejoining us. I'm glad we didn't scar you from our last live experience. You did scare me, but you know I'm back four months later. It's <laughs> enough time to recover, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Spent the entire every day in therapy, going, "Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that?" And now we're back. Um, and we've got a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful chat joining us today as well. Eric Black is here. Oh, SJW Jesse is here. I'm glad you're back again today. <laughs> Object Racer 21, who's been very, very excited. Uh, we are so excited to be here, guys. Zach Blackfire. Thor Gaze, welcome, everybody. Um, so this is the first ever movie club. Uh, if it goes well, there might be another. Uh, and the idea was, so I've been talking to Richard ever since you know, we did our last stream about how much I really enjoyed getting to just talk about movies and uh, how could we bring more of that? Uh, you know, right now it's a weird world. We're in a post virus, not even post virus, still part in virus. Not sure what's happening with movies, movie theaters, et cetera. Filmmaking has kind of, I don't know, we've seen a lot of genres being recycled over and over and over again. So how do we make talking about film fun? Uh, and so for this first one, I asked Richard to, uh, be the first to suggest a few films, and uh, and we we picked two of them that to, that we're going to compare today because there's some pretty obvious parallels and some pretty obvious differences. Uh, and enough about me. Uh, the first film that we're doing, not that we're talking about, nothing but a man, uh, is a very special connection to Richard. So I'd like him to talk a little bit about how he first came to seeing this film and uh, and how it spoke to him. Um, I chose the film Nothing But a Man because of uh, the strong impression it made on me when I saw it when I was still uh, in school, in college, actually in law school. And I was an unhappy law student and I was looking for escape. But um, I, I, I visited New York on one weekend and went to a theater and saw Nothing But a Man. This was, you know, uh, like 1964, 1965. Um, and because I, I think, you know, uh, especially American film uh, was in the desert at that time. And there weren't any films that ever, to me, um, portrayed black folks in a way that fleshed them out and gave uh, them a life, a family, uh, institutions that they were a part of, and then the difficulties they had with their, within their own families or interfacing with uh, society at large and their work life. And um, so it uh, was a, a movie that in 1964, 65, made a huge impression on me and led me to a, a quit law school and uh, start uh, looking for work in documentaries. And uh, from my early work in documentaries, dealing with social unrest and, you know, social, uh, upheavals and anti-Vietnam War and all that, that led me to working in feature films eventually. But Nothing But a Man still remains in my mind as something that propelled me into the direction of um, working in, in films uh, and not 
just in movies, even though I ended up making, you know, big movies. But my uh, intent was always to try to make something in my mind as strong and uh, true, it seemed to me, of uh, in the story of Nothing But a Man. I, uh, I mean, it's not the same type of film, certainly, but I think that the good that it's done for so many people and the many, many people it's reached, I like that Star Wars has had like a, like a roughly equal cultural impact if we're talking size, at least, you know? A, a so, um, I, actually, it's funny. It's, it's funny to bring that up in front of this particular group of people here because we are three people who have those kinds of connections with Star Wars where it meant more to us than just you know, oh, a movie we saw when we were were kids and whatever, but it really had some of those impacts, you know? It really was the thing that inspired us, drove our imaginations. Yep. I, I made me realize what was possible in the scope of making movies, telling stories, uh, imagination. So, mission accomplished. <laughs> because you definitely yep. reached us in that way. Um, well, there's no parallels, you know, between the grittiness of uh, Nothing But a Man and the uh, fantasy uh, of Star Wars, but somehow I guess they're related because of what we see on the screen as an audience brings to us in one way or another uh, examples of exemplary, you know, exemplary yeah. behavior, I guess, that we aspire to, whether it's heroism or yeah. whatever to deal with stuff. So I, I think that's the good thing about movies if they reach us. Exactly. The common denominator, I think, is the humanity, you know, and that for me, that's what was so striking about Nothing But a Man. I purposefully waited until after I watched it to read more about the context and Same. the making of it. And I'm really glad I did because coming into it, all I really knew was, OK, it was made by a couple of white dudes. And that was really it. I didn't even know more about um, and we'll, we'll obviously get more into it. But the director, uh, Romer, he was a uh, German. He left. Uh, he fled during um uh, the Holocaust, and he had a very, a, as a German Jew, and a very different approach than, you know, to, I'm sure, to a uh, racial tension in America than somebody from a different background. Uh, so I'm glad just so going into it, I was like, what's a film, film made in 1964 about, you know, a black man? Uh, and that, though, it was, it was, it was, it had fewer stereotypes than I was expecting. It had more nuance to the characters like even to the side thing, that's what we're, we're, we're really is really impressionable for me is the side characters the side characters all had personality and depth and whatever they weren't just you know token black character number three uh and that was such a such a shift too from even a lot of of films that have come later that featured black characters um so i think that was like the the fullness and the realness of all the characters i think was the most the thing that struck me the most uh on my first viewing I was surprised how fun that guy was. Yeah. Like, in a way, he almost didn't fit in, and that's not a dig at the movie. It's like he had so much more life than the other characters at times, the way he spoke. Yeah. And he was interesting uh, in that regard. But I found myself enjoying this movie way more than I thought I would. I just, I don't know. Movies from that era have always been, you know, one type of way of life. Like Richard said, you don't really get to know these characters more than, you know, stereotypes. Also, two early 60s films, I think, of stuff like James Bond movies and stuff, or the TV shows that are afraid to show any sort of real look at American life. Mm -hmm. And so while this is in the 60s, it's still, for its time, like a pretty real look at certain things, like when he you know, visits his son. Or it talks about themes and topics that I guess was this was a groundbreaking way, but it still feels kind of relevant 50-whatever years later. Yeah. Dion, first impressions? Um, well, I, well, I, for this film, it's 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 uh, interesting for me, you know, mainly from the point of view of you know my 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 family. So I know, you know, as as Jeff is well aware of, you know, my parents were were older uh, when my sister and I were born, but they grew up during this time period. So I think it's it's uh, contextually it's it's interesting because you know this movie came out in 1964. This is the same year that the Civil Rights Act was passed at that time. So for for at that time, it's a very relevant film um, for what was going on at the time. So uh, you know, and and knowing my parents who were you know my mother was an educator and was very 
uh, aware of of these type of things being shown to my sister and I. So for me, you know, I had seen the movie when I was really young, and then obviously coming coming back to it was kind of a nostalgic experience for me. But uh, you know, your first impression of the film is like, man, there's a there's a lot going on here, and you know, and seeing it as a child and then watching it again as an adult. Um, you know, that impression is still there, but, you know, again, contextually, you know, it, it, it has a, a, I guess, a more enriching uh, impact on me, you know, obviously, you know, watching it now. So, uh, but yeah, as, as a child, my first impression is, wow, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> and, you know, and, and as a kid, you're used to seeing films that are grandiose and a lot's going on and explosions. And then when you see this as a kid, you're like, damn, you know, that I didn't know that this could be, uh, in a movie, it could be this could be in a movie, and it's really good, you know. And then as an adult, life experiences, and and you have the context of the film and the time period, and you watch it again, and and it's just interesting that I still had the same reaction where it's like, damn, there was a lot going on in this movie, and it, and it still is really good, and it's a nice stark reminder, especially nowadays, that you can have so much going on, and it doesn't need to have explosions, it doesn't need to to be you know, Star Wars, you know, it doesn't need to be a, a space opera for you to be like, damn, this is really good. And, the, and I am entertained. And it, and it makes me think, especially, you know, compared to, to films today where, you know, things like, you know, like nothing but a man are a little bit more heavy handed. It's, it's, it's harder for, you know, in, as a, as a fan, I should say, it's harder for people to get that message across without it being, you know, so heavy handed and so, um, I guess uh, subtle is not the word, but it's just hard to get that same message across with while it being entertaining. So that's for me seeing it twice, so to speak, is has been is it's 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 pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. I I love that you had seen it, you know, previously. I think that's that's such a I. Didn't I, I tell you I bet Dion had seen it? You did, yeah. You I had, did. I, we have never talked about this, Dion, as you know, but I was right. like, Dion saw this movie. Yeah, because I do I do want to get into it too, a little bit like this. It's the context, like the background of it's interesting too, where it's like it came out and then it had very little budget for distribution. You can imagine at the time it wasn't, you know, going to be a widespread, it wasn't going to have a certain amount of widespread appeal. Uh, and uh, And so over time though, people, I guess, have discovered it and realized how important it is, what, you know what value really and it won some some huge awards at the time and so it's like i guess it got a it got a dvd release too in 2004 and then another something a little bit before that so it's sort of over the past couple of decades has been pumped back into the consciousness a little bit uh but it's it's fascinating how like this it exists it happened it did all the things that it did and yet so many people missed it at the time. You know, it's been preserved now. It's been, I think it was put in line of the Library of Congress as a film of like historical significance and whatnot. But how many people missed it, you know, when it when it came out and for so long? Well, I think the fact that it's on YouTube, yeah, multiple cuts for free, like multiple yeah. videos of it for free, kind of speaks to it. Not that it, you know, is a bad film by any regard, just that it kind of lives there. Yeah. And it keeps getting uploaded. So in one way, you can't take it away because it's very important to people and they'll keep finding a way. But yeah. at the same time, it's it kind of only lives there. Maybe it should have a bigger... You, know, uh, you could go to a store and find it. Not, find it on the know. shelf, yeah. Let me tell you one story about um, how I screened it 10 years ago. I was um, a guest uh, professor at Wayne State University in Detroit. And um, they gave me an award, kind of to lead it off. And uh, they asked me, what film what I show at the Detroit Institute of the Arts, the DIA. And um, in that town, that's kind of like a cultural institution among the, I guess, the elite. And um, that night, after I did um, an interview on stage, we rode that uh, picture. And uh, afterwards, of course, there were a lot of people uh, who lined up and wanted to talk to me about it. But what particularly struck me and remains in my mind was this one woman, uh, an older black woman that was in a over, this was in January of uh, like 2011 and it had been snowing. So this woman was in a black overcoat and she was at the end of the line uh, waiting to come up to say something to me, but because of the length of the line, she eventually left. And uh, my wife uh, noticed her 
and went and got her and said, you have to come back up. Do you want to ask Richard something? She says, yeah. So uh, my wife brought her, you know, up to the front of the line. And she, by the time I met her, I could tell like she was probably in her mid to late 60s. And this was 10 years ago. So um, hopefully she's still among us. But um, she, I, I said, how do you do? And blah, blah, blah. And she says, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I never thought I would live long enough to see this movie uh, uh, screened here, shown here at the, this museum. She said, this is, this is Detroit. And you don't know who controls Detroit, but whoever they are, they would never show this film. So mm. the, uh, the wife of the sponsor of my you know, chair, my teaching chair, uh, she came up to me afterwards and she says, so uh, Richard, uh, what does this mean? What are you trying to tell us? So I just thought the contrast between the reactions between these two women yeah. to this film says a lot about, you know, uh, yeah. the film and how it stands the test of time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and so that brings us to our more modern one, uh, Mudbound, um, which only came out four years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, too, though, because that I think it's going to be part of the discussion, how much things have changed in four years. I mean, that just because it's modern and, you know, relative to the other one, in some ways it feels like if you were to make the same, if you were to adapt the same novel today, it would be a different one only four years later. You oh, know? yeah, the be cultural, uh, well, society and the tensions and things have changed right now. We know last year was crazy. And so, yeah, I think the last few years has definitely changed the landscape where you couldn't adapt it in that way. It would, that's, I don't know too innocent no that's not the right word you know what i mean easy almost too easy the way, the way they yeah handle it. if it makes sense i don't know so richard when did you first come across it and and yeah tell us a little bit about how you first came came to mudbound oh i you know i saw it because it was uh when it was released i guess it was in 2017 whenever mm -hmm. it was and it um i guess it was the again the multiplicity of characters and how they intertwined that uh, uh, really got me, you know, uh, um, uh, bound up in it, so to speak, got bound up in the mud. I was, uh, I appreciated the, all the characters, the institutions they represented, and I thought it gave kind of a layered look as to what they were coming out of, what they were part of, and uh, the bleakness of the situation, especially when the the uh, guys that went off to war returned to America. And there's always that contradiction that has always impressed me about how uh, people, especially minorities who go off and fight and die for us, you know, for the safety and comfort of America, that when they return home, that they don't experience the same uh, benefits of it. Yeah. So you know, on that layer, but then to, to, just to see like, I mean, Mudbound, these people are all kind of caught in this same quagmire. They can't get out of it yeah. somehow. They're just caught and bound in this. And, they, and as, as much as they try, they're victimized, you know, by the same things, the economic forces and the, the historical kind of burden of yeah. the relationship. And you know, I, I, I just thought it was, it, it, I, I like the structure of it. I like the kind of the intertwining of the uh, voiceovers of the, of the many characters uh, from both families. And um, um, and I, I, I really <laughs> even like the spare score mm. behind it by, uh, I can't remember her name right now, but the composer who did this uh, did, I thought, some really inconspicuous work yeah. uh, underlying the scenes. Yeah, uh, it, there was a there was a lot of artistry in the filmmaking, which was uh, sort of a stark comparison to Nothing But a Man, which was done in a, like a almost cinema verite kind of hyper realistic mm. style. Uh, and it was, I think, like it was that it was the it was the visual and audio artistry like the, the 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 really choices to make it you know poetic in certain ways that uh that 
helped with the pace because I actually looking at it and thinking about it, I'm like, for me, a movie like that in that time period, it's about a two and what two and a half hour movie, almost just yeah. a little shy of two and a half hours. I always like, I always just am, whereas nothing but a man by comparison is about 90, 90 minutes. minutes, and uh, and you know, the difference comes at the, at the end when you there's a part, there's a point in Mudbound where. I think, okay, where I stopped and thought, okay, when are we going to get to the point? You know, there's a point where it slows down enough for long enough that it takes you out of it where I'm like, okay, I think that's rescued by all those artistic measures. The, the, um, uh, the visual focus on the nature, on the physical parts of their world. Um, one of the, also though, earlier in the film, to me, one of those striking moments was when the father, the black father falls and breaks his leg uh, at the same moment, you're seeing that in the chaos there visually, the same moment the sun is tank is being blown up and you're hearing that and that marriage. Those are the kinds of things too, where it's like you didn't have that in in like regular narrative film back in 1964. Like that that type of cross cutting and like didn't exist experimentation, yet, right? it really didn't exist in the yeah. So that was sort of that was such an interesting thing. So I can't use the word interesting too much, but that was a fun comparison of what what is different in the storytelling between these films because what doesn't even exist yet, you know. Um, it's interesting though to see the past through a modern lens, and it, it doesn't always work. But like that kind of filmmaking makes it interesting. Like yeah. You watch like uh, what was it? Oh wow, the Nolan one, the airplane, uh, the World War Two one, Dunkirk. Yeah, you know, you're watching a World War Two era story yeah. with modern filmmaking techniques, Techniques, yeah. and it also ma almost makes you feel more connected to the era because yeah. if you're watching, oh, it's just like this, and they're just like us. I think it, in, in a way, some of these period movies, when they're made like this, kind of takes the wall down and then makes you relate to the characters more because they're people like you in just a different era. Kinda and just like because time had changed doesn't mean people are that different. Yeah. It's just the clothes and the few beliefs and this and that you can still relate. It's kind of like the filmmaking style becomes a way to translate the language. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, Dion, what were your first, uh, what were your feelings about Mudbound? Was this your, was this time through your first watch? Had you seen it before? Uh, yeah, this, this, this was the first time I'd seen it. I, uh, you know, and, and, and honestly, I do actually have to have to finish the movie. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it, it definitely, uh, is, is interesting to watch that film, um, after rewatching a film like nothing but a man, uh, you know, and, and especially those type of stories are good. Uh, you know, because it's, 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 you know, from what, you know, watching it so far, it is very, very historically accurate. And then to see, you know, that story being told from that time period um, is, is, is definitely, you know, it's, it's a, it's a refreshing experience, you know, and then too, for me, you know, watching that movie, it, it, it heavily reminded me of another film and I, I was actually trying to find the, the name of it, but there's a, a similar film with Danny Glover where he also was a World War II vet and he comes back. Um, and then his son, you know, years later ends up taking part in, in sit-ins and, in, in, and it was in rural Alabama. And right I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the film, but it reminded me of that, you know, that same um, story where it's exciting because of the subject matter. And again, it's not something that has to be, um, you know, combined with explosions and, and all this stuff. And for me, Mudbound, um, you know, it, it actually made me want to go back and watch that film again because you have these characters where, you know, like Richard had mentioned, are you know they go out, they're they're risking their lives, they're fighting in 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 uh, what is you know one of the most important wars in in world history, and then to come back and to be you know to live in 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 Jim Crow and in segregation, especially in the South, it's just one of those type of stories where you're like, you know, as I mentioned before, damn. You know that is that is that's a lot. You know that's a lot to go on, especially from our lens where things are 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 different. We're still experiencing, you know, some things of that nature. But to to see that again, especially, you know, in a Netflix film in 2017, and how relevant it still is, and and a, a nice reminder where it can be, you know, done so well is is it's it's fun. It's it's fun to go back and watch that and and to and to see films like that 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 definitely kind of 
uh, reheighten, you know, your sensitivity to, to that subject matter, you know, which, which for a lot of people, it's hard to do. It's hard to go back and watch a film like Mudbound in 2017 or today mm -hmm. and be like, yo, this, you know, this is, this is, this is something that used to happen that was very real and that real people went through and films like Mudbound, you know, for the most part, do a very good job of, of making that story real for people who may not have experienced anything like that. So it's, um, it's fun. It's interesting. And, and like I said, it, it, it definitely was, uh, like I said, nice to be reminded of, of films that have been done like that, similar subject matter, similar characters, but they're still different. So yeah. I liked it. Awesome. You said you had a, we well, yeah, just real quick. Uh, when Richard brought up the trope of the soldier coming home, it's funny how that story can be told this way now, but if you go back and a lot of the fiction, Anytime it was a soldier that came home that wasn't getting their just due or they were done wrong, they were injured or they were something they looked or weren't able to speak, but they were always a white guy. They weren't telling that. They weren't telling that story. They were telling uh, like in, in comic books, guy comes home. He's deaf. He's standing there saluting. He can't change whatever. Why are you yeah. smiling at this flag? Blah, blah. Turns out he was injured in the war. And but they do all these like home stories, but they never were tackling that stuff. So it's kind of always been there post world war ii but now you can chip away and tell more of those stories i mean since for decades they've been able to yeah but not when it was like just a fresh event yeah yeah you know um i did a little reading about uh what the book the structure of the book the novel yeah. that the movie's based on because the screenwriters um virgil williams and d reese they did a massive kind of restructure yeah of the uh, the story in the book and um, among the things that they did was <clears throat> that made it effective for me is using this device of the flashback because it begins with the burial of the, the father, Pappy, right? And then uh, and, and uh, when they, the, the two brothers can't um, get the coffin into the ground, they ask for the help of, um, uh, of uh, um, yeah. um, gosh, I've, can't remember the name of the dad, Mr. Jackson. Hap. Hap. Yeah. yeah, and then, uh, you know, then you just see his reluctance and you don't understand yeah. what preceded that. So I love that kind of uh, storytelling that begins kind of in the middle of a film or even at the end of a film. Yeah. And you have to go back to understand the backstory that, you know, that led them all to this point. Um, I noticed, I noticed something too with that where, in the opening, they change a word, they change the line. They actually give you a red herring in the opening where he said, he says what, it was an accident or something. Uh, you know, it wasn't his fault or so something. It wasn't his fault or whatever it was. And so you're, it's kind of a red herring. You're like, wasn't whose fault? What happened? Like who's you realize they're somehow connected, but now I'm sort of waiting for it's, I think it's sort of purposely misleading, purpose, uh, so you don't know what's coming. Uh, and mm -hmm. then the line is different at the end. He says, he says, you know, uh, I warned him. I warned him this was going to happen. Uh, and it like re it changes also. It re I think it's a very smart move too because it it reserves judgment of that character. Um, the what's his Henry. Uh, or something, the dad, or the, dad. The, the, one the, the, yeah, Jamie, the, one the younger, the younger guy is Jamie. And Jamie's the younger one, but the old, the older one, the older brother is Henry. Henry, yeah. So it really, it kind of reserves judgment on Henry because it's at the very end, like he's a, he's that. I mean, the the three men on on the white side become that representative. You have the actively racist father, the uh, son who's inherited this world and doesn't question it, just sort of accepts his place in it and goes along. And you see that, you know, right off the bat with the way he just sort of feels very entitled to the black family's time and resources. And then you have Jamie, of course, who's seen the world, who's seen some, sh some shit and uh, has a, uh, is now the that next evolution. And uh, and so it's throughout a lot of the movie, it sort of it sort of reserves judgment on Henry in regards to his rela racial relations because it never sh it doesn't show him doing anything positive to stand up for them, but it also doesn't show him doing anything to actively try to hurt them. So it leaves you in that place for a lot of the movie of like, is he really a bad guy or does he just need to be sort of woken up and, and sh whatever. And then that line at the end where he kind of says, Oh, it's his fault. I told, I warned him like, how can you hold this guy accountable for what just happened? And you're like, all right. I couldn't tolerate his character. I was, I was hoping something bad would happen to him the whole time. He was really like, he, it, it was well, such a, he was such a well done bastard though, because like, you're talking about Henry, right? 
Yeah. 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 Well, Henry's kind of like is like most, I think, people that stand on the sideline, they take part, they assent to it. They, you know, they they agree with it by not saying anything. They just go along. They, they get along, they go along to, to get along. And exactly. They never speak up, right? So that was that character. Whereas and the young brother, you know, had a different take on it because of what he saw. I was just going to say something about what the screenplay did, I understand, was how it opened up, um, because the book didn't do this, was because it's a movie, you had to, like, see uh, what um, uh, Jamie did uh, in the cockpit as a a bomber pilot and what um, uh, Ronzel did uh, as a tank commander. And I I thought it was interesting that they were each – uh, put into really confined spaces, like they were trapped. You know, one was trapped in the cockpit, getting shot at, and the other was in a tank, also getting rockets fired at. And they were both in danger and both contained. And uh, they somehow survived that. So in a way, it's kind of a metaphor for uh, what they found themselves in when they returned from the war. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That the words um i think that that's such and a that contrasts to where they live and wide open space and exactly. all that fun stuff but and yeah they're still trapped. i was so compelled by them like i didn't care about the life on the farm i yeah. didn't care about the old man and the racists in the town i just cared about these two dudes coming back from war and like when that part of the story happened i was like cool now what's gonna happen are we gonna watch two guys uh, bond over something tragic and then like go down this path of like drinking and this and that is that the movie we're about to see or that and then it, you know it ends up a different way but i was so compelled by them like it yeah. was a good friendship that superseded bullshit and as we all know yeah. that's important yeah i think that's that was yeah the the power of that and i think that's such a that motif can you can trace that into any story about people from different backgrounds connecting you know it's putting aside their differences whether it's their identity or their status or or their country that makes them different uh it's it's those common experiences and this is something i always say when you we think about the world we live in today and how easy it is to write somebody off as a sum of their beliefs that you could put into whatever 200 whatever characters on twitter all right that's who you are as a person and you could read that and think god i have nothing in common with this person they don't think anything like me they don't they don't believe anything i believe and and how could i ever have anything in common with them i i, I can never speak to them i can never be nice to them i can never treat them with humanity but if you actually take time and get past the superficial things your some of your beliefs you know the the pieces that have been put into you by the world, other people, and actually just talk and share experiences, those commonalities, those common human experiences that connect us are more powerful and more universal than any of the, uh, in, you know, these more tangible, but less real things. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's definitely a good way of, 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 seeing that uh you know and I, and I think the other the other important thing to note about especially like a movie like like mudbound is you know you you have that aspect but also you know how uh you know huge cultural and 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 in some cases uh i guess legal uh you know ways of life and entities like jim crow and racism impact those things so you know especially where you have you know you know guys who are bonding over being veterans while at the same time culturally you know one is supposed to be inferior to the other you know and to see that those experiences and to see what you're what you touched on there jesse in that lens you know it's it's, it's an important story to tell it's, it's a nice reminder of, of the way that things used to be but also how important it is like you said you know to 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 transcend all of that and and how those people interact with each other in the things that they learn and experience at the same time so uh you know especially you know with such a heavy uh heavy subject that's in mudbound you know to see that is is you know, it's a testament to how the movie is made, how you're able to to balance all of these, you know, life experiences and and doing flashbacks and balancing, you know, <laughs> two different families in the South, you know, you know, one white, one black, but hey, but we also fought in World War II, so it's 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 not a lot of 
films and filmmakers can handle can handle that that yeah. story. And it, it's it's very important, you know, and it's a testament to the film, you know, how well it has to be done to balance all those things and still have it in a way that the that the that the that the film watcher can digest it and experience it. So it's uh which is it's it's a pretty gnarly thing to accomplish. Yeah, as I said, there's a lot in that movie when you think about it. There's yeah. a, like it's two hours and change, mm-hmm. which isn't really that much. I mean, we come out of the Avengers that are closer to three hours. I now. would have personally cut about twenty down, but you know, just for for pacing. But uh, I mean, when we get to it, I thought the ending was just kind of you know a little extra that you could have just you know cut out. But my point is though, Dion, you're right. There's just so much in this movie, but it's threaded mm-hmm. together so well. Yeah, I, I never once went. Oh God, here we go back to the farm. Even though right. I was interested, I still was like, all right, back to the farm. Now what? Right. It does feel like a tightrope at points where you are, you're living in that like, oh, like how you, you were, and it, it really had a good intelligence of the way it bounced between the perspectives where it's like, you can't spend too long with any one thread because you can't risk, you can't risk getting too invested in one character over the others. You have to be they're part of everyone's journey. They were interwoven. Exactly. Yeah. Their fates were entwined. I, I was going to say that um, a lot has to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a praise directed toward Dee Rees because I haven't seen her first film. I don't know if you guys have. Her first film was called Pariah. I've heard of it, but I haven't mm. seen it. It's about a black lesbian. Yeah. And she herself is of that persuasion. So, you know, that was her debut film. But the fact that uh, she did this film as her follow-up film is like, wow, <laughs> that you're willing right. to on this subject now after yeah. you know, your debut <laughs> film. I mean, right. Speech, right? That she yeah. had. Um, but I, I did read one thing about um, her collaborator, her screenwriter collaborator, Virgil Williams, mm-hmm. that he was the guy that came up with the end yes. of Granzel, you know, seeing his son uh, back in Germany. Uh, because in the book it, it didn't have that, yeah. and uh, Virgil, he, I, I like what he said. He said I felt that it had to have some kind of hopeful ending, because he said, he says I have strong feelings about having. There's a lot of children not having black children not having fathers. He says yeah. I want to make a point that our, this guy was you know going to go back and raise his son. Yeah, so that I was. Oh, that he, you know, he put that at the end because some people have accused the film or criticized the film of being so, uh, you know, Hollywood like, you know, right. to have an ending like that. But um, I thought he made a good point. Well, Richard, that was my favorite part about both of these. The, the one thing, if you can tie these movies together, because there's that, you know, the stigma in the real world, and both of these movies cut that out. They're like, hey, I'm going to go back and get my kid and do the thing. On a you know, on a regular level, you watch this guy see what a piece of crap his dad was and how he wants to change it. Yeah. And then in another one, this guy's gonna go back and live this life and do this stuff. Uh, I thought those were nice. Honestly, those changed my perception of each film because yeah. they're very dour topics. And so to live in this 1940s, the South, and this and that, and it sucks. Yeah. So to have that, like I needed a palate cleanser after this movie, but like that was a nice way to yeah, I don't know. It wasn't a Hollywood ending to me, it was just a nice human ending, like yeah. something it needed. It was that was the fact like to, to both movies had an optimistic ending and very similar in that you know it was the man was gonna go and fight for his family, uh, and uh, and the one of my big all right, so let's get into some parallels and parallels. I uh, at first I wasn't I noticed the use of gore and mudbound right off the bat. Uh, like the big moment when they really show the brains of the guy in the cockpit when Jamie's. Uh, uh plane is getting shot at uh and i'm like why i'm like is this just a product of this time being you know the way we the way we make movies oh we can show it so let's show it and i realized that it was for a purpose it was it was to create the contrast then at the end when the kkk mob is stringing up you know ronzel and they don't show they really cut away from the cutting out of his tongue and all that they don't show that level of brutality i'm like okay so, i like that they make you guess what they're gonna do to him. true yeah they don't that's a that was a nice slow burn on the reel because i'm sitting there too thinking like oh god what am i because he's all swollen underneath the the, the carriage or whatever. yeah so you see he's all beaten up so you're like oh god so you don't know though yeah they they show everything swollen up so you can't tell we've all seen rocky we know what it looks like so. exactly so uh yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it, uh, 
Uh, I totally just forgot what I was. Doing. You were talking about the violence and the, the oh yeah, contrasting of by contrast. I thought nothing but a man hits some of those same edges, puts like sets your teeth on edge in the same ways, and gets you wrapped up emotionally to the same levels and scared for the character in the same way without ever showing him bleed. Uh, and uh, I just wonder if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about that, like the violence and the way violence and gore manifests in Mudbound versus is certainly suggested in Nothing But a Man, but doesn't never manifests the same way. I think it's like a Hitchcock thing. Sometimes yeah. less is more. In Psycho, you don't even see a knife go in. Yeah. But people call that the scariest movie ever. Yeah. I think sometimes when you don't see it, it's much more impactful. Actually, every time I think it's much more impactful not to see it. So I was on edge wondering what are they going to do to this guy at the end, this, that, and the other. So yeah, yeah less is more. That's my... I think it, it definitely depends on the story you're telling. I think... Uh, you know, especially from a from a fan consumer point of view, you know, gore is just as much a tool as say, you know, the lighting in the film. So I think with with a with a film like Mudbound, and then comparing it to Nothing But a Man, you know, the, gore isn't the best tool just for that story. Nothing but a man. Whereas Mudbound, you know, you have the backdrop of war. You have the backdrop of Jim Crow. You have the backdrop of living in a very Southern uh, environment. So, so using gore in that story, is just a different way to, to whether progress the plot to ratchet up tension, you know, as opposed to nothing but a man, that's more, you know, it's, it's, I guess for just for lack of a better phrase, it just doesn't fit that, story that you're telling at that time so you know you having having the the story of a of a of a of a, of a guy who's working on a railroad um and dealing with his you know his his fiance's preacher father that's just not where you're going to use that tool as often as opposed to you know families sharecroppers in the south dealing with the the threat of being lynched you know it it just fits that. It fit. That's just a better tool in that. In that, for that, for the tool belt that you're using. So it's, which is, you know, especially for 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 you, Richard, kind of a, of a lens into into Jeff and I's movie. You know, we recently watched um, Tales of the Hood two, which is oh. which is from Rusty Kandif, and they're trying to tell the story of of uh, a guy who's working uh, for for a a politician, and he's. You know, they 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 ham fistedly throw in, you know, him speaking with you know uh, Darren uh, Emmett Till, yeah, yeah, Emmett Till and all this, and you know, I thought of this movie last night too. Oh god, right? And to, and to Jesse's point about the use of gore, that one is that's a great example of misusing that tool. Yeah, where you're trying, it's more of a shock value, ham fisted way of, hey, remember this thing that happened, as opposed to Mudbound, where it's like this, that tool re-emphasizes the importance of the time period in the story that we're telling. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and as Jeff and I have, have laughed many, many a time, you know, Tales of the Hood 2 and, and him being lynched to somehow connect with, you know, Emmett Till and Medgar Evers is a huge misuse of that, of, of gore yeah. in that story, you know? Well, so, yeah. to, right. I think it's a huge misuse of just the trying to tell a racially motivated story that thinks it's doing good like <laughs> Rusty right. Kandif made me feel bad as you know my ethnic background on film like that's a film that's like oh I was offended because you know this character looked this way I'm like you made me feel bad for existing because of this type your views on relationships I'm like wow <laughs> and this is a progressive movie like what are you trying to show me Rusty and, and that's a great example to you know to Richard's point about you know the movie being criticized for a happy ending you know that's that's an example that's one reason why you do that that's one reason why you have your characters have a happy ending because, you know, when you see a movie like Tales of the Hood 2 where it's like, oh, uh, this dude has a young wife and she's pregnant and he's, oh, well, sacrifice yourself. Just just sacrifice yourself. That's a great example of why you need to have films with with more of a of a of a positive ending, you know, because it's it's that's another tool in the tool belt. You know, how do you want the movie goer to feel in the process what they just saw? You know, not everything has to be, you know, a doom and gloom ending, especially when people are trying to, you know, criticize or, or critique a film. Yeah. Uh, I want to this really. Yeah. Oh, I, I was, was going to bring up one thing about um, how the church 
was used in each film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, the father of Abby Lincoln's character, the pastor of his church, and you would say that it was very conservative and it kind of uh, what led to his accommodation to kind of the, the white power structure of the town. Yeah. Whereas uh, Hap in Mudbound was also the preacher of his church. And I like the fact that the church structure was always incomplete. You know? Yeah. It was like half put up, mm -hmm. yet he was an essential part of that community because of his preaching. And even mm -hmm. at the end, man, I mean, for him to come back to quote, I guess it was from Proverbs or oh. Psalms, yeah. you know, over the burial of this evil man. I thought like yeah. that's where he came back and he he put in the knife and, and turned it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, using... Uh, his uh, authority of the Bible, because he was the spiritual man, and these uh, the, the 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 other guys didn't have an ounce of that in them. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's just it's funny you bring that up because you know especially you know uh, watching Mudbound or you know the majority of Mudbound, you know, and then obviously having just recently watching um, Nothing But a Man Again. You know, and then you bringing that up, that just it reminds me so much of, you know, a raisin in the sun. You know, how the religion and the church is such an integral part of, of so many characters, you know, and, and obviously a raisin in the sun being where he's trying to build this church for for nuns and, and just movies of that nature, you know, how, you know, in some way the, the religious aspect of, of a church or or a, or, a, or a holy man or a preacher or whatever being always being in those type of films you know, always, um, you know, it, it makes me smile because it's like, hey, especially for back then, that's a huge integral part of each community, of each character, of yeah. why they feel the way they feel or, or why they're reacting to that current situation in the film that specific way because of, you know, whether they agree or are a member of a, of a, of a church or not. And I just, it's always interesting how that always comes up in those films, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, as, you know, as, as, you know, as I get older, seeing that, that, that theme brought back up is, you know, it, it seems like those type of movies always need that type of linchpin at some point in the story where it's, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just, it, it's always a nice insight into each character, what they're doing, why they're doing it and how, you know, it's, I, I like how that always comes up in those type of stories. Well, I think it has, it's kind of interesting because it's like how to fight violence with nonviolence. Look at how half the dad dealt with what's his face, yeah. the main guy, the, the white farmer kind of yeah. just, was a parallel of how he dealt with existing. He doesn't do the violence. He doesn't, you know. But I also think it's fascinating what Richard brings up too, though, how it's they're really using up to represent opposite things for the communities, though. And nothing but a man, the you know, nice conservative preacher is represents the black people, you know, putting their heads down and integrating with the community and, you know, uh accepting their new, you know, shorter stick, as it were, but going along and just saying whatever. Whereas in a, in a mud bound, that's sort of the representation for their strength and their, their holdout. It's, it becomes that, you know, his role as the preacher that gives him that weird power at the end to stand there and look Henry in the eye and say these words, like while communicating so much more. And that, I mean, that strength he has in the, in the moment just before that is a, no, my sons will not come down off this wagon for you. Uh, it, it's, I actually, and that's like, that comes to for me some of the fascinating parallels about these two movies because they both strive to represent their time periods accurately, even though one is made so far removed from it and one is made more contemporaneously. Uh, that realism so highlights just the difference because we're set in, you know, a very similar area, very similarly culturally, the 20 years of different, of cultural difference. Uh, between these two films I mean little moments like in nothing but a man the way that one of the white guys at some point says oh we haven't had an incident uh, or anyone die or whatever in eight years and how they want to keep it that way you know how like it's it's messed up that that's their reality but at the same time they're in a different place because all the white people in the town would really prefer that we not have any more killings. Whereas 20 years before, you know, a couple towns over, they don't give a flying F. It doesn't matter. They're, the life of a black man is whatever, who cares? You know, it's like that 20 years made a, 
some things in some things were exactly the same. You know, some of the ways that the the white people would just completely dismiss black lives and and their existences as lesser and whatever. But then the overarching climate, you know, of uh, was completely different versus even a man who was out being a war hero comes back to this South and knows that he has to keep his mouth shut, knows what kind of trouble he can get in for just speaking up. Whereas 20 years advanced, you have a guy who feels comfortable saying, I think now is the time where I can test the waters and push the envelope a little bit and make those changes. It really is like a complete cultural shift at that point. Well, it's a nice reflection of where society was from 41 to 64 Mm -hmm. and how, people it's all a way to change and there it wasn't like a just a cycling of circling of the drain waiting for it to end it was like all right change hope progress this and that they were working towards something you talk about the short stick there was a stick they were working towards it it and then by the the next decade blah 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 blah. yeah it's like in mudbound your only way out was to literally get out and run away but now it's like okay you can stay and maybe staying and fighting is an option now can i um make a comment about the um uh the stylistic uh, way of telling the stories between the two films. Please do. In um, Nothing But a Man, um, it was uh, presented in almost like a cinema verite uh, fashion, even though it's fiction with actors. Um, it had this really stark black and white uh, photography that was accentuated by the use of period music which at that time was basically Motown yeah. to give you the feeling of the texture of the time. And I love that because that really uh, gave a ground work, a cultural groundwork for that yeah. period. And wherever they, uh, the characters were, it had that. There was no other score no. You know, to speak of. It was used by song. And I yeah. think, you know, in, in terms of um, the use of pop music in American film, it, it really kind of grew out of that time in the 60s because later on, of course, Martin Scorsese and and his um, those that came after him just used a lot of the popular music at the time. But I think Nothing But a Man, for me, early on, that was like really unheard of that you use music that you would hear on the radio in yeah. the movie. And it, it really, I think, worked well uh, for me to kind of define the different environments that we found our characters in. As that was, opposed to um, how modern uh, Mudbound was because Rachel Morrison, who is the DP of yeah. it, she used purposely, as you notice, they timed the picture so it was really kind of dark. And yeah. I kept on wanting to turn up the brightness <laughs> on my monitor, but I realized, oh boy, it was timed that way because it gave you the feeling that it was muddy <laughs> because it had that kind of brownish tinge to everything. Uh-huh. So was yeah. And yeah. I liked your photography, which was so different from the uh, black and white of um, yeah. Nothing But a Man because in Mudbound, um, she used a lot of like uh, uh, blues and greens and reds in the background. So you might be say on a close up on Mary J. Blige and then in the background, which is dark, except for maybe a green light or uh, the red light of a lantern, you know, uh, off in the corner. And it gave you a feeling of depth, even though, you know, you didn't see the whole room. So I thought I was really cool of how uh, the style of photography was so different uh, from Nothing But A Man. I, uh, Nothing But A Man, kind of when I was watching that, it's funny when you said mentioned Scorsese and and some of the influences later. Nothing but a man actually reminded me a lot of Alice doesn't live here anymore. And I was just looking up trying to see if I was trying to remember if that one I think that one was black and white as well, wasn't it? Uh I don't or was or that one was done in color. But it was but it was like it was very similar. Like it reminded me of uh the same kind of movie of let's take a, a person who's in a like who's trying to change their station, who's trying to change their situation and sort of, and only has a, has a limited amount of agency uh, and is sort of meandering through trying to find the right per- people to uh, help them get there. So I, I wonder if nothing but a man was in, in any way an influence for Scorsese, um, for, for Alice doesn't live here anymore because it really reminded me of, like I was- You did bring that up when we were watching. I did when I was watching, I was like, it's surprising Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yeah, it's just kind of weird. 
Um, what else was I had? For? We did discuss the music though. That was the first thing we noticed during yeah. the credits. Because like, oh, little Richard and this and there's something little Ray like, Charles or something. Oh, it's yeah, it like, oh, wait, for this being a movie that I've never heard of, it's gonna have a pretty good soundtrack. And then Richard, you brought up the whole painting the cultural picture. Yeah, music's hugely important. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you can have the right period. Well, it's a it's of its era but like the music is what takes you back more than anything else notice it, even scorsese to go back to that when he makes casino what does he do to take you back the soundtrack yeah it looks right but the music alone will will take you back and i think that helps that movie yeah. because it cements it when it's you know the civil rights era that makes it contemporary and an important era yeah okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um also guys uh in case you didn't know to know this is for chat as well uh this is uh, nothing but a man is Yafa Koto's first credited role. So mm. and, and Julius Harris, and Dion, Julius Harris, yeah. both bad guys from Eleven Let Die make their debut right. in this movie, and that's the part I was like, "Holy shit!" James Bond connection. I was sold right there. That's I right. did. I did not know that. That's so. <laughs> that's awesome. That's and awesome. Julius, oh, Julius Harris Koto. is a, a messed up arm in this movie too, yeah. but it's the opposite is arm. So I was like, "He's famous for having a bad arm in each movie." Cool. <laughs> but no, Yafa Koto is a great actor, and I, it was just cool to see where he started because. He's mm -hmm. always been the guy. You talk about civil rights and stuff. He always has seen himself above yeah. being a black actor. Like go back and listen to his interviews about when he was in James Bond. You yeah. know, he saw himself in the same le in the same way. Yeah. It was cool. I, I like it. always love Yafa Koto's work. He was. I wanted more of his character. If I got anything else, I wanted more of his character. Nothing but a man. We were joking. We were like, "Oh, I want to write the. We're gonna write the sequel now because like I wanted more of that movie." And my sequel version, uh, Yafa Koto's character Draco comes back. He decides he's gonna come move into this town too and help Duff start a union. And then they, you know, do all that stuff. And maybe, and maybe I don't know. Draco gets in huge trouble because he dates himself a white girl or something. Are we gonna? Super illegal, are we gonna so. CGI Yafa Koto and Ivan Dixon and everybody? Obviously, and, yes. So we're just gonna. This is gonna be a deep fake movie. <laughs> Been talking about the actors. I, I think it's really interesting that Abby Lincoln, yeah, you know, he's a very famous uh, and uh, hot uh, performing um, jazz singer, right? She yeah, as artist in the '60s. I forget who her husband is right now, but he was a, a, a very famous um, a jazz performer. And then we see Mary J. Blige. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, right. That. That's funny. Super singer and an activist. You know, being in this movie, and I yeah. just coincidence, you know, my choosing the two films, but that's one area of commonality. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think uh, Abby Lincoln did another film, or at least yeah. of that, you know, stature of caliber. Yeah, sure. But I, 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 just, I just feel, you know, the quiet confidence um, yeah. that she had, or how she played her character, and even the dialogue. To me, I mean, even upon seeing it again, of how honest it seemed between this couple that yeah. are, we're trying to feel each other out you know and because the the man uh, uh ivan dixon is challenging her like why aren't you more angry why aren't you this because you see that she's been kind of brainwashed by her father into accommodation yeah whereas you know ivan dixon character man he's duff he's been out on the line you know working in the, both the saw, you know, the, on the railroad lines and the sawmill, he knows what it's like. And that's why he's angry. Whereas she's like uh, a school yeah. teacher with little kids and kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. community. Yeah. So it, I like that of how in this story that he's challenging her, but yet, you know, she, she doesn't take any uh, guff from Duff, right? No. <laughs> exactly. Right. Challenging him like, Hey, you know, and I like how they teased each other. Yeah, and that tenderness, and then yeah. of course that end when he decides, okay, I'm bringing my boy home, and I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to starting a family, all over again. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Her her reaction to it too, like the way she was about the son, and like I loved that character. I thought this was something for me, I uh, because we talked a little bit about stereotypes and how they manifest in these films, and how like, I, and I, I'm not surprised now looking into the production that you know now seeing that nothing but a man really escaped that because reading about it, these two gentlemen decided, so Romer and Young both went to the South. They said, we're going to go to the deep South and we're going to research the type of people that we want to write about. And uh, being Jewish, uh, Romer was not treated very well in that environment and was far more accepted by black families there. And so actually was given the opportunity to really see what he was looking to research, but then also 
have that sympathetic view because he was treated more like them than he was, you know, another white man. And, uh, and, uh, that I think that he, that really manifests in the humanity. I think that's something like, uh, the wife in Mudbound it falls to some of those stereotypes of writing women of the time with no agency. She has zero agency whatsoever because the point of her character is that she's a woman of the time period and women of the time period don't have agency, which is fine. But, and it also works because the rest of the movie does use the, it uses the rest of the characters as symbols as well. So you don't, you don't notice the places where the characters become two dimensional because they're all symbols uh, in a sense. But Abby Lincoln's character, the wife in this movie, isn't. You know, she represents something as well. Everybody in that movie represents something as well. But she's really a full person in a way that I don't think Carrie Mulligan's character ever got to be. I, I, I forgot she, she was in that movie. This whole discussion, I forgot about her. It, right? Exactly. It feels like it doesn't feel like Abby Lincoln is sitting there waiting and crying and whatnot for her man because she has to or because she doesn't have an option. Uh, you, she you feel like you actually feel how devoted to him she is like you. And because like you said, the way they write their banter, them teasing each other, them like each time we see them together, he's ribbing her about something that shows they've built a little more relationship. Uh, uh, that like, even though we see her being quiet and demure, we get a sense somewhere she's opened up to him because they know each other now. Uh, and that made me really root for that relationship even more. Like that's the payoff of him coming back to her was so deep for me. And some of it's like, you know, now that I have something like that in my own life, when I see other characters that look like they have that same connection, I really, you know, it really gets me on that deeper level. I really relate to it. And I root for, I root for them to work out. Um, so I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the nuance that they wrote into that, even though she had those, that the complacence of her society, that they did give her personality and a point of view. You know, she maybe couldn't fight for the same things Duff was fighting for, but she could fight for her family. And and that's what she was going to stand there, you know, be there for. I really, yeah, I, I, I appreciated that. I thought she was, and not to like compare, so it was better than the other, because I do think, you know, Carrie Mulligan's character has a lot to do and serves an important purpose in Mudbound. But Abby Lincoln's character is just more real, is more full, I think. I agree. I think we watch Carrie Mulligan just to get angry at the other guy. Right. So then we can, like, appropriately hate the people we're supposed to. Because it's like, she's the victim of so many things in the beginning of the story. Yeah. Because it's like, however you want to phrase it, the institution, this family, whatever, they suck. <laughs> so she's the first victim of their suckiness. Yeah. Then at the next phase, you know, it's kind of Jamie coming back. From Jamie the war comes back and gets dumped on, and then Grandpa. Yeah. Which, by the way, Dion, I'm glad that was the bad guy from Beverly Hills Cop because I was glad to see him die a yeah. second time. You killed Michael right. Cantino. You, know, you killed what's his face. Now we're gonna get you back again. Uh, long story short, though, I just thought she just served as a victim to like make you hate the bad guys more. That's it. And then once yeah. she had her miscarriage, she kind of didn't exist. Kind of faded away. It's like, yeah. yep, that was it for your. That was all you needed. Yeah. Was yep. Just a tool. You know, in a way, if you look at, um, you know, there was that other, I guess, a tenant farm, the wife that killed her husband. The, the uh, her character's name was. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, you know, in Mudbound. I'm sorry. I'm talking about Mudbound. Yeah. That that was kind of like a harbinger or, a, a, yeah. you know, it was like, this is what the Carrie Mulligan character could end up doing. Exactly. You know, out of that same uh, desperation and self-defense. That yeah, maybe yeah, she yeah. go and kill Henry, you know. So, but we see a mirror of that with, uh, you know, the wife with the that. I forgot about. That I scene. feel like her infidelity, though, later becomes that's her moment. That's her knife moment, you know, because it's mm -hmm. the 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 woman who kills the husband. It's him who is running around at her, and so her sticking the knife in moment is that is sleeping with the brother, you know. It's, right. To to bounce off to Dion's point, this movie had so much. I forgot about that subplot right? of the. The, the farmer hand that he fired and she comes back and I like, Oh, what? that wasn't this movie. There was so much that happened in this movie. Yeah. I don't I know. know. If was just, that, but... You know, it was like this. Yeah. You got to uh -huh. see it a couple of times. In fact, it's even unclear to me upon seeing it again at the end, whether Ronzel was actually, did he die or did he survive? Is this a fantasy that he, oh, did I never entertained and, and yeah. got to see because there was a, a shot of the wagon 
as it pulled away, the family pulling away with a wagon, and he was and he's underneath. Car. And it was, I think, it was such a short cut and yeah. dark enough where I couldn't tell if that was his uh, body. Is that his body, or is that or are they sneaking? Was he actually had he recovered? You know, uh -huh. because his voiceover, I forgot what the lead in to the voiceover when he was in Europe. You yeah. know, then huh. you begin to feel like, wait a second, is he? Is this a wish <laughs> that he had right. before he right. died? You know. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I didn't think of it sad, like that. And yeah. I'm just kind of like, oh uh, no, he got he got to go home to Germany and see I his like, son. I like thinking of it that way. That was such a because like both of the in in some ways like they're fantastical endings, you know, in a way. Uh, it's there's so much there's so much that has. Well, I guess not necessarily fantastical, but like reach it reaches in good ways because there's so much that has to happen in Mudbound. You know, that's to go right for them to be able to get the money to send him overseas for him to go and then be able to build a life as a mutant in Germany with this woman and live happily ever after. You know what I think it's real, though? Huh? His face. Uh -huh. When she opens the door and says his name, he doesn't look happy and this and that. He looks kind of sad and this and that. He looks defeated. Yeah. He looks like he's the, that's the result of all the shit we had just watched him. And like he couldn't even like be so happy. Actually, no. You know what sells it for me is the fact that the voiceover talks about him carrying the the thing that says he was a mute in the in his oh, the card. Yeah, when he traveled. Yeah, that it references his him actually him traveling as a mute. Um, but like I said though, in that one though, a lot has to go right for that to be the ending. And then even in Nothing But a Man, a lot has to go right from this moment of him coming back and declaring we're going to make it work for it to actually work. You know, he's burned every bridge for job prospects in this town. He's got some people you know hot on his ass and all that. So like. Both of these movies leave you with, and they lived happily ever after. But if you sit and think about the reality of this happily ever after, there's like, I don't know. It's it almost like it leaves you in that dual space of like we wanted the filmmakers very clearly pointedly wanted to leave you with optimism, but at the same time, it only takes about a second of thinking about it to realize how much. I guess maybe that's the whole point, though, is that at the end of these movies. There's all of those things. There's the struggle that they're still going to have to face. There's the life they're still going to have to build for themselves. Every obstacle they're still going to have to fight for. But the important thing for the filmmakers to leave you with is that there's hope and that there's love, you know? And that's... I was thinking the fact that they returned back from the war as unscathed as they did too yeah. is as realistic as him being able to get back to Germany. I think like yeah. that... The way they came back and like both survived these terrible things. Like we've watched Jamie's co-pilot and the other guy, the gunner, get yeah. shot down, and I was like, "Oh, I guess he's done." But because I missed the moment in the beginning yeah. where it was whatever. But like, I yeah. think they avoided so much death mm -hmm. and so many things that that extra because the movie I don't think took itself too seriously as it is. It's a very heavy thing, but like the way they kind of gloss over him, rebreak the dad, rebreaking oh, his legs. The fantasy. Like there's a fantasy. I think that was already there. Yeah. So I didn't think it was too much to like to think about him having the happy yeah. ending. I think it fits both movies very well yeah. because of they're realistic to a point, but then they also like keep you along with like a good story. Yeah. Hey, what does Dion think? <laughs> yeah, what does Dion think about the endings? Well, I know you didn't. So okay, so you said you didn't quite finish Mudbound, so we'll finish. Right, so I haven't finished Mudbound yet. We're um, kind of spoiling it for you. We talked about it then already. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, no, you're fine. You're fine. I, 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 you know, it, again, it's Dion's I, fault for not finishing the homework. So, well, well, and, you know, and I've mentioned to Jeff many times. You know, it, you know, I, it's, having a spoil isn't really going to ruin it for me. You know, a good ending is a good ending. And and I, I listen. And for nothing but a man, um, you know, it's it's especially those type of films. For me, I love when you're seeing them go through all this craziness, and then to be like, oh, okay, it's kind of like a a sigh of relief, and it, you know, and, and I'm a, you know. I'm excited to to see if I feel that way at the end of Mudbound, but that's one reason why you know nothing but a man is so good overall for me. It's because of how the ending is like. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and and this this is my goal. This is what I'm gonna go do. Be it dead, and it's like ah, like okay, all this craziness is happening. I I like I said. I, that's why I always enjoy when the ending is 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 more on a positive note because it's you know it's. It's just nice to see all this stuff happen to the characters. You're going through all this, and then okay, it's 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 gonna be all right. And I think that's a very important tool for a film like that. You know, given the subject matter, that when you have that ending, sometimes it's okay for the moviegoer to be like, oh, okay, that's yeah. that's good. I you know, it, it helps 
you know, and, and that's part of what makes the the film so memorable, especially in this particular case, me watching as a kid and then watching it as an adult again. Um, that, that's that's an important tool to have for 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 a film like that yeah. for me anyway. I agree. Uh, I I. I uh... I totally just lost my job. I, oh, I do want to read this real quick from Eric Black because I think he sums it up really well too. Uh, I thought both Jamie and Ronzel were going to die in the war, but then they went home, which was far more tragic than World War II. <laughs> that's the terrible irony of this movie. Yeah, it really is. Uh, oh, that's what I was going to say is with a movie like uh, Nothing But a Man, this style of filmmaking, this like very uh, hyper-realistic um, uh, style so frequently has a hyper realistic ending, which is very bittersweet. And you know, some things work out and some things don't. I think that was so refreshing about it and necessary. And like, yeah, it's great to make movies that are real and realistic and end like, okay, that's how life goes. But I think sometimes it's more powerful to end it the way we want it to end so that we can be inspired to, to make life imitate art in that way, you know, to, to build the worlds around us that can have those happy endings. Well, yeah. you know, let me just say something about a happy ending. I mean, nothing but a man. I don't know if that's a happy ending as much as uh, there's going to be a relationship between, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the man and the woman starting a family because the, the, the white racists in town, oh, they're yeah. going to be there. They didn't get it. Right. Uh, the yeah. employer is going to also acquiesce, acquiesce in this, you know. So yeah. how how is Duff going to make a living? How is he going to do it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I wonder. And if he doesn't have the support of of his father in law, you know, I it, there's a lot of ambiguity in real sure. life. So okay, you know, you can start a family with a woman you love, and she supports you. She is a she will still be a teacher and has a job. But you know, do you have a job? You know, I mean, yeah. the future for him is pretty bleak. <laughs> yeah, so. but there's but there's optimism. Like I said, that's why like I I like that the filmmakers choose to focus on the optimism in that moment, right? Uh, instead of anything else. I think it's a reflection of the world we live in that we're looking at optimism like that. <laughs> that's as, optimism. That's optimism oh, yeah. today. <gasps> oh god, because the world's so dark and gray right now that you're like, oh, no. that's great. I'm happy for right. that. <laughs> well, at least they have each other. I, yeah, I'd like to give a shout out mm -hmm. to uh, one of the filmmakers of Nothing But a Man. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Romer, unfortunately, has passed away maybe like 10, 15 years ago. But Bob Young, Robert Young, uh, is still with us. Yep. He's in his mid-90s now. Mm. Uh, not in great health. I saw him a few years ago. And because he was instrumental in getting me my first job, oh. um, in television because like after I saw the movie, I, I skipped over this part, but when I saw the movie and quit law school, I went to New York and looked them, uh, looked them both up, Mike Romer and Bob Young. And, and Robert Young took the time, even though I was like a kid with no credentials, he took me out to coffee and uh, in, this was in Manhattan. And he took me out to coffee and he spent like, I think an hour with me just getting to know me and um, he asked if uh, I could send him a resume, which I did, which was like, you know, this long. <laughs> he, he, uh, he sent it to Seattle, uh, where this television station, uh, with, you know, looking to, to hire people. And so he helped me get my first job oh, as a wow. television news cameraman that eventually, um, you know, led to my uh, working in documentary films. But Bob Young today... He's still with us, and uh, he, after Nothing But a Man, he made a series of uh, films, uh, among them um, with uh, Eddie Olmos. And, mm. um, uh, and, you know, really a lot of interesting films that really dealt with characters that aren't normally uh, portrayed in movies. So thank you, Bob Young. Um, I hope you're, you're well, man, because uh, you've uh, meant a lot to me. Oh, that's awesome. Thank that's you. Awesome. Indeed. That's, that is awesome. It is. I love the <laughs> I love Richard that. stories. You have the best stories, Richard. You have the best of stories. Uh, 
uh, that I thought this was, I really like, honestly, once we finished watching these movies, I was like, I can't wait to talk about these because they're so That's exciting. all we've talked about. Oh my gosh. Today. They're so dense. And so, and Eric Black, thank you so much for all your contributions in the chat as well. Notice, I noticed right from the get go, you mentioned that these really hit you hard as well. They were heavy films. So thanks to everyone else who watched, uh, uh, and we're enjoying this conversation. I was trying not to get lost in the chat because Eric was right. making great points the entire time. Right. Yeah, an optic racer. I'm just like, okay, hold uh, on, wait, I gotta pay attention. Exactly. A bunch of the times where I was like, oh, that's what you thought. Because I was reading what you guys had to say. Uh, and I did. I did promise Richard I wouldn't take up much more than an hour of his time because it's, it's so generous him to be here and do this with us. I always learn a lot from uh, from talking movies with you. Um, it's amazing to have that perspective. Uh, were there any any thoughts, any things that you guys want to say? Any last thoughts or or things or stuff we didn't touch on that you wanted to throw in there um, before we before we uh, put the pen? Out? Well, just real quick, I, you know, back to Richard's point about you know Mary J. Blige and um, uh, uh, yeah, Bobby I think Lincoln. that's yes, Miss Lincoln. I, there's a very special magic in specifically casting you know, musical performers in certain roles, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, before I, f I almost forgot about to, br to bring it up, but I just think that, that it's awesome because I don't think you get that same performance from someone who isn't also a musical performer, which it's is so true. important, you know, especially when you're bringing up, you know, their relationship in, in both films, how they interact with one another, you know, you don't, you know, I think that's a, that's a very specific mindset that you get from, oh, well, before you, you know, sing in front of people, whatever the genre, and then becoming an actress or being an actress in a, in a, in a, in a film of that nature, you know, you don't get that if you, if you, you know, if, if it's not Mary J. Blige and say you, you know, you get, you know, uh, uh, another actress who, who doesn't have any experience being a performer, I don't think that's a, that you don't have that same relationship. I think that's when movies do that, it's, it's, it's cool to see. And then, you know, even subconsciously. Oh, also, that's oh, that's Mary J. Blige. That's that's yeah. Abby Lincoln. You know, I that's a that's a specific little bit of magic that you don't get if you don't have a performer. Which is, I, you know, I love when they do that in films. Yeah, yeah, you have an emotional connection to their voice, and that's something too with the voice. And both women had this in these moments. I think just the way Abby would go, yes, no, yeah, like, and just it's the the richness in their voice in their quiet moments, right where it's like even actors who are trained to use their voice don't have that same type of fullness in their voice. You only get that singing jazz, baby. That's what yeah, I, I love. No, exactly. I, that's a great point. You know, I, that's, yeah. that adds a little bit of extra to it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, any last thoughts? I, these were both films I had never heard of until they were recommended. I enjoyed them both. And I actually feel, I don't want to say enriched because it sounds a little hyperbolic, but I enjoyed these to the point where I, will want to watch more stories like this. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Like to the nth degree. I had a good time. I want to watch old, new. I'm just interested in like the human condition on film now. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be science fiction and explosions <laughs> like Dion says. Right. <laughs> It's it's so refreshing for me because in our regular topics, a lot of the types of movies we talk about are not ones that put a lot of focus or energy into the artistry of filmmaking. You know, the actual cinematography, the soundscape, pushing limits, everything's trying to just do it according to the Hollywood standards so we can win an Oscar or something. Uh, and so it's really great to actually get to watch films with that critical eye that have all those, that have that level of thought put into it. Um, it, because it's there it's done for us to enjoy and for us to gain something out of and it's 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 delightful to be able to be an audience member uh and be given those things from filmmakers who've poured their hearts and souls into creating it so that was fun for me <laughs> richard will give you the last word i think it's really cool that um that i've helped uh maybe pave the road uh for you to take to appreciate all the production elements the creative elements that contribute to the making of a movie because it's too easy to uh, watch uh, a movie and to say, man, that sucks, you know? And right, to right. It, or to say that, you know, I mean, to, it's easy to be critical. Mm -hmm. It's much harder to appreciate the, 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 the craft, the thought, mm -hmm. you know, behind making it. And even though it's a failure, maybe, but still, I mean, people, you know, conspired with a bunch of other people to do mm -hmm. that, to say yeah. something, usually. Yeah. And so that's, you know, if I can um, use my experience of decades working in movies behind the scenes, if I can help 
a viewer appreciate more what that viewer is seeing for whatever reasons, uh, I feel like, like, you know, I've done my job. Uh, I I have been helped. Amen to that. Yep. <laughs> we have all been the, definitely the benefactors of that today. Uh, thank you, everyone, again so much for joining us. Uh, this was the first ever movie club. Uh, great. I had a great time. And uh, until next time, if there's a next time, God Empress, out.